Ian, welcome back. And I've been ignoring fusion. Well, I haven't actually, but there's been a lot going on in my life. A lot of interesting stuff. But today, let me give two thumbs up, kind of, to Lawrence Livermore and the Ignition Facility for doing this. Uh, today, we're here to talk about fusion, combining two particles into one. Last week, at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California, scientists at the National Ignition Facility achieved fusion ignition. Simply put, this is one of the most impressive scientific feats of the 21st century. Great, but <laughs> I want to put a bit of a damper on what they did and why it's not really practical. So, first of all, what is fusion? Fusion is you and me and everything. We're all made of fused atoms that were made in stars, probably our sun. Our sun took the smallest atom, hydrogen, which is the most abundant element in the universe, and squeezed it together, boom! and made helium, ooh, squeezed it together, and eventually made everything up to about iron. And that's what we're made of. We're mainly oxygen and carbon. We're a carbon life form. Thank you, sun. But it took a really long time, a lot of heat, and mainly a lot of pressure. So what's the difference between fusion and fission? Well, fission is where we take hard unstable, heavy elements like uranium and plutonium and make them break apart, releasing energy and making the world's most nasty stuff. Fission reactors is the anti-philosopher's stone. It's turning gold back into nasty radioactive lead. Literally, the stuff made by a fission reactor is the nastiest material in the world. Let me tell you what happens. This is ignored by the nuclear industry. The most nasty stuff has to be dropped using a force like gravity, because everything else would break, into a big pool of water where it rests for about 100 days, and then you can start using electric motors to move it around and bury it or store it forever. It's nasty, dirty stuff. The holy grail is the complete opposite. Instead of using the heaviest elements, which you break apart to release energy, you take the lightest elements and you join them together, and that also releases energy, and that's fusion. But... <laughs> but, yeah, and that's, and that's a very big but. It's normally up in your sky. Our sheep love sitting under it and getting warm. The sun, the star. <laughs> and it can fuse hydrogen into helium. But it doesn't actually fuse hydrogen. This is a really important point. Basic physics, which is ignored in your news and ignored by a lot of people on YouTube. It doesn't fuse hydrogen, it fuses hydrogen plasma, ionized hydrogen. Hydrogen is a central core surrounded by a field of electrons. A hydrogen atom is neutral. If you go with a magnet or a giant electromagnetic force, it's not attracted or repulsed. It's magnetically neutral, it's stable. But if you can rip off all the electrons and leave the tiny, teeny core, which is positively charged, you've ionized an atom, you've ionized hydrogen. The ionized center, the plasma state of hydrogen is attracted or repelled by magnetism. You can do stuff with plasma because you can move it around. Anyway, as you know, I'm interested in that. But how does a fusion reactor work, Simon? 
Well, it almost doesn't. It's incredibly hard. What you really need is the sun. If only you could put the sun in a box. But part of the thing about the sun is its mass and that size. And actually the sun fuses the ionized plasma of hydrogen into helium very, very slowly. It probably took thousands of years per fusion reaction. And it only does it because it's giant and it's got a lot of pressure. And right in the middle, it's not that hot, it's kind of hot, but it's got so much pressure that the little wee ionized hydrogen atoms, which are now in plasma, are pressed together by the mass of the sun. But they hate each other because they're both positively charged. We all remember from Big Six that like poles of a magnet repel and opposite poles attract. The hydrogen nucleus, without its electrons, is positively charged. And if you try and squeeze two of them together, they're going to keep on repelling. The closer you get them, the more the repelling force. It's only because of the giant size of the sun that eventually, and this is a very strange physics, if you get them just close enough, they're never going to touch. But when that gap is so close because of the immense pressure, Neutrons can jump from one hydrogen to the other and boof, it makes helium. Suddenly it forms doof, into a second atomic structure and releases a vast amount of energy. But you can't do that in a box on Earth. A sun in a box? No. But, but luckily there's another way. You can replace pressure with temperature. So if you can make hydrogen plasma hot enough and get close enough to each other, it would potentially fuse into helium. And in fact, people do that all the time. It's nothing new. You can build a fusion reactor. Well, I think you can probably buy one on AliExpress. But the problem is your electricity bill, it uses a vast amount of energy to get the temperature up, the equivalent of pressure, to get these hydrogen ions together and to fuse. What the holy grail is, is to fuse hydrogen, release more energy than you put in it. And that's not really what they did at the ignition facility. So you come to work at the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory and you um, reach over and you switch everything off and then you turn it all on. Uh, the electricity bill must be amazing. <laughs> You've got all these lasers, I think there's over a hundred that all have to power up. They've got flash guns, they've got cooling, they've got fans, everything. They're ignoring that part of the bill. But once you've got these lasers at credible expense powered up and they're lasing and producing lasers towards a source and you ignore that electricity bill, the amount of energy that the lasers put into this tiny, 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 tiny bubble of hydrogen gas, which is actually hydrogen in the form of H2, which is deuterium or H3, tritium, well, I don't know if they made that clear, and fired the lasers in, sure, it actually fused together and made helium, and it produced more energy than the laser energy that hit it, not the amount of energy that the laboratory used. It didn't really produce positive electricity supply, just that I think they put energy in the factor of one in and they got three out of it, which is fantastic. Well done, ignition facility. But that's not a power station. It only lasted a tenth of a nanosecond and isn't then repeatable. It just went, but it's not a sustainable reaction. There must be another way of producing fusion that is sustainable. And there is. ITER se trouve tout au nord des Bouches du Rhône, juste au-dessus du CEA de Cadarache. Welcome to France. This is ITER. ITER is in the south of France. And instead of firing lasers into a tiny bubble of hydrogen, they're going to make the sun in a bottle. A bottle of what? A bottle of plasma. Aha! 
plasma makes a giant container and the walls of the plasma are incredibly hot, but they can be kept away from your stainless steel outer container by magnets. As long as the magnets keep on working, the plasma will never touch us or normal matter. So inside this bubble of plasma, this bottle, you can put hydrogen, get it up to an immense temperature and hopefully it will produce a positive output. And that's what they're building at ITER, this giant machine, to see only this, that they can sustain a continuous fusion reaction. Not make electricity, it's not a power station, it's an experiment. Extracting that heat from Lawrence Livermore or from ITER into steam, which makes a power station work, I think is at least 10 years away. I think ITER should be getting sustainable fusion by 2030. And I think it's going to be 2040 until we have the world's first fusion power station making electricity here in France. <laughs> so well done, Lawrence Livermore. If you ignore all your expenses, you actually made energy. And that is that's absolutely fantastic. But thanks to the wonderful Scott Manley, he told me in this video, which is really excellent, about another way that I'd never heard of to produce fusion energy. Let Scott briefly explain. There's also a company called General Fusion. And, well, their design has a, a rotating metal, liquid metal vortex. And they have like these plasma injectors at the top. And what they do is at the right moment, they inject a whole bunch of like superheated plasma with deuterium and tritium. And these pistons then squeeze this vortex of liquid metal together. And it slams hard. And the inertia of this slam increases the pressure, increases the temperature, and they get a flash of fusion. And the nice thing is that the heat that comes out is absorbed by this liquid metal. So it pretty much covers the whole getting energy out system quite well. Thanks, Scott. That's sonoluminescence. Remember that? Probably not. I'll put a link to it somewhere around this video or underneath in the description. It was an effect that was observed in submarine propellers where turning water made bubbles that made light. So a liquid metal fusion reactor using sonoluminescence, using pressure, I think is fantastic because it overcomes a whole lot of problems. You're actually using a force of nature, pressure rather than heat. And because of the liquid metal, you can extract the heat to make a power station work. I personally think, and I'm gonna be wrong here, and I'll explain why, but I think sonoluminescence liquid metal fusion reactors are our future, but they're a long way away. I think what we're definitely gonna see first is ITER in France, and they're gonna have a sustainable fusion reaction in five years. I think the ignition facility in Lawrence Livermore have done a fantastic job, but they've thrown power and energy at solving a problem for science, not to make you have a smaller electricity bill. Fusion energy today is still the famous 30 years in the future, but one day we will crack it. Is this the type of video that you enjoy? I do research for you and hopefully things that interest me interest you. If you do like some of what I'm doing, give the films that you enjoy a thumbs up, ask a question, leave a comment. That tells the evil empire called YouTube that I'm on the right track and making stuff that viewers enjoy. The truth is out there.